You know that uh, even as a church family, that uh, that we, especially as of recent, now there's there's never a time. You know, sometimes when things don't personally affect you, you, uh, it, we just go through seasons in life. Can you just, that, that is just true, you know. The Bible says as long as the earth remains, there'll be seed time and harvest, summer and winter. And so they, we all go through, we go through seasons, and sometimes your season of life, you may be in a season of harvest. And at the same time, somebody that you know and you love dearly, uh, they may be going through a very difficult time. It may be a stormy time in their lives. And uh, and so it seemed like, it, as certainly as of recent, you know, from the spring on through now, that we've had just a tremendous amount of, uh, of things happen within our church family that have not been, they've been hard, they've been, they've been difficult, they've been, they've been challenging. We've We've lost family members. We've people have been stricken with illness. Uh, unforeseen things arise, just seemingly out of nowhere. Well, you know the Bible really has a tremendous amount of to say about this. Uh, Tanya, uh, you know, uh, picked a uh, a lineup this morning, certainly appropriate, and and uh, you know those things are always done prayerfully and carefully, and and we finished it is it is well with my my soul and the song was written really by a businessman and the businessman was enormously successful and uh he was in chicago he was very well invested in in real estate he was prospering just 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 doing very well he was a he was a good man loved god had a beautiful wife had five beautiful children and uh it just seemed like at the pinnacle of life the man's last name was spafford horito spafford the pinnacle of life he loses his son i told you he made a lot of money in real estate you know what happened shortly after that you know where he made his money with chicago the Chicago fire hit. He lost nearly everything. And after several years, he decided, you know, that they, you know, they kind of gotten back on their feet. And he decided that, you know, that uh, he would send his, his wife and his daughters and they would go on a trip. They would go on a, uh, go to Europe and travel Europe and see things. They, they needed a, you know, a much needed break from the many things that they had gone through. And and as he's wrapping up business in Chicago, he gets a telegram from his wife. Said, all are lost, save me. And he'd lost his four daughters with only his wife left. And so he goes to meet his wife who's grieving. And he pens the tremendous words that we read from it as well. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Folks, everybody can have faith when things are wonderful. And I thank God for wonderful times in life. You, nobody gets to live their whole Christian experience on the mountain. David was a man after God's own heart. And he said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they do comfort me. Even a man of faith like David walked near the valley in his life. So we're going to talk about the storms of life because the truth is, is that unfortunately, they, everybody experiences them. And if you're not experiencing one or if you haven't yet, you know, it's, it's just part of life. You will. I'm going to pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to share your good word. Again, I believe it's good seed. I believe it's producing good fruit in Jesus' name.
Amen. So let's begin, you know, that I, I realize that uh, you and your pastor, that uh, you don't get to be a specialist. <laughs> you know that, uh, you know, in, the, in a lot of fields they have specialists. It's certainly true in the medical world. You have people who are eye specialists, ear specialists, you know, uh, somebody, uh, somebody of their heart, the neurosurgeons, things of that nature. They, they, they specialize. And often you'll find that that's true in the ministry, and you listen to different people, and and uh, and you know and they they seem to specialize in something. And if and if you're careful, off you listen. If all you ever do is listen to people who specialize in one area, you get you get overbalanced in that particular area. You know, if they preach, you know, the, nothing but the uh, uh, folks. This guy believes in the goodness of God. I believe God is a good God, but there are other things in the Bible you got to deal with. All right. I believe in the blessing. I believe in prosperity. I believe in healing. Uh, you know, I, I, I embrace those things. At the same time, when you pastor a church and you have to live with people week in and week out, you can go to a crusade and, and they, can, they can talk about power and anointing all week and, and you can walk on a cloud. And you think, gosh, I wish my church was this way. Listen to me, their life's not that way. Amen. Their life's not that way. Everybody experiences what we're going to talk about for the next several weeks, but I'm, we're going to give you hope, okay? We're going to give you hope. We're going to grant answers. You know, the Word of God is true. It does not return void. It always accomplishes that which is sent to do. Can you say amen? amen? Well, we're going to begin. Understanding, once again, life storms. In Matthew, the seventh chapter, verses 24 and 25. It says this, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man. Everybody say a wise man. Now, this is not a wise guy. This is a wise man. We've got too many wise guys, not enough wise men. Puts them in. He's a wise man. He built his house on the rock. And the rain what? Everybody say the rain came. All right. That's not me. That's Jesus. This is red letter stuff. If you've got a King James Bible. <clears throat> then rain came, and the streams rose, and the wind blew, and beat against the house. Let's read that again. Let's read it together. Just that sentence is, and the rain came down, and the streams rose, and the wind blew, and beat against the house. Now what's the next, next few words? Yet it did not fall. Amen. Say amen. amen. Now I want you to focus on that, it did not fall. Because why? The rain's going to come, and the stream's going to rise, and the wind's going to blow, and it's going to beat against the house. Yet it did not fall, because it, was, because it had its foundation upon a rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built this house on the sand. You know, I haven't had to spend, you know, a little bit of time, and of course everybody has seen it, you know, whether, whether you've been to the ocean or you've been to the Gulf, or everybody has seen because, you know, you, you see these things on television. But having spent quite a bit of time, you know, in Florida here these, these past several years, and, and, and then just from life experience like you seeing these things, you know, on television, you know, when a big storm comes, I, I mean, it just absolutely changes the beaches, just changes them. We we were at Pensacola one time not long after a hurricane. I was just it, it just just you know the beach was here and when the hurricane was over the beach was up here. It just it just changed it. Well, uh, sand moves. It shifts. It's not stable under your feet. You stand on the edge of the water, and you're standing on the sand, and the longer you stand there, the, the, the deeper you sink. Isn't that right? Yeah. Too many times we build our lives on the sand. The rain came, same story. Streams rose, <laughs> the wind blew, and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. Now, you know what I want as a pastor. It's my desire. To communicate God's will. And that's it. You don't crash. You know, there's, Paul writes about, about people whose faith has become a shipwreck. Your faith doesn't have to be a shipwreck. Even if 
storms come. We'll give some answers concerning these things. I want you to know that those who believed the word and obeyed it, and those who even heard the word and didn't obey it, but they both went through a storm. Storms in life are not always predictable. You don't always see them coming. Just, whoa, I didn't see that coming. Listen to me. They're just not always predictable. You can't always predict the weather, can you? Storms of life are not always predictable. They're inevitable. Accepting that. You know, so many times in life I've heard, I've heard people say, and we, we, some of these things we'll touch in several different ways and say them more than once because, once again, what you're trying to do is the most important thing to do as a believer is being able to have your mind to be soft and pliable where you can change your way in thinking. See, there's nothing worse than stinking thinking. See, with the Word of God, we're trying to renew our minds, change them, all right? So, so many times in life we'd say this, well, you know, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. Why is things going wrong? Stay with us this morning. All right? Those who heard the word, believed the word, stood on the word, they still went through a storm. But their house stood. It was founded on a rock. They're not predictable, but storms are what? They're inevitable. Matthew 8, 24. With, everybody say, without warning. without warning. Ooh, without warning. Without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. Now, can we, you know, a lot of times we really pick on the disciples, all right? Don't be thinking you and I are any better, all right? Can I tell you, let me tell you something about the disciples. They were professionals at understanding the weather. They spent their lives in this area. They knew that you didn't want to be out there in the middle of a lake. Of course, it's a pretty massive lake. When a big storm rises up, but it came up, it came up quickly. It came up suddenly. It, was, it, it, it surprised them. They were, they were caught off guard. The storm came up upon the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. Once again, these guys are not novices, not on the water. In life, you can't always predict what's going to happen. Storms come. I want you to see how much of the Bible was framed by storms. How much of the redemptive story is connected to storms. They don't play a small role in Scripture. We begin with the great flood. And Noah built an ark. We find by continuing that Jonah, he tries to run from God and he tries to sail to Tarshish. God wanted him to go preach at Nineveh. He didn't go. He gets on a boat. He goes the exact opposite direction. And on the way, a great storm arises. The disciples, in just what we just read, they were, they were crossing the Sea of, of, of Galilee. And how, how many lessons, life lessons are learned in that story that, that took place. It's not a parable. It's a true happening. Jesus comes walking on, on the water in the midst of a storm and tells P Peter to come again. How many great life lessons are framed around Peter getting out of the boat and then beginning to sink? And then we find this. Paul's voyage to Rome. He's going to go stand before Caesar. They start a little late in the year. They, they tarry a little too long. The hurricane season is upon them. And they try to make their way to, way to Rome. And a storm once again comes up. 
and impedes their travel. So we find that when we look at Scripture, there's just a lot to say in relationship to storms. Now, just as nature, nature's storms help to shape the landscape of the earth, the storms of life will help to shape your faith. Now, your response to that, I always like to say this. You know, what the devil's often looking for is a reaction. When you react, it'll usually be wrong. What God looks for is a response. See, a reaction is based upon the emotion. We've done it. I've done it. All right? But a response, now once again, that is, that's built upon conviction, thought, belief, faith. So how those storms shape our lives will depend whether or not that we just react or whether or not that we respond. Remember we told you about Paul. You know, Paul will sometime probably look at 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, and look at it a little bit more fully. And he gives quite a long list of challenges that he's going through, or you might say the many storms, trials that he'd gone through in his life. It's, it's, it's a rather lengthy list. But just concerning this issue, he says, Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day... In the open sea. I know it says three times. Three times he was shipwrecked. I'd stay off a boat. <laughs> now in Acts the 27th chapter, it tells about one of these shipwrecks. Remember three times I've been shipwrecked? This is his last one. So he, he gets to Rome after this. He finishes his life there. And Paul had told him not to set sail. It wasn't right. We should stay here. I, I, I believe much harm will come. But Paul stood before them and said, said, Man, you should have taken my advice. You just hate that guy says, I told you so. <laughs> Man, you should have taken my advice and not sailed from Crete. Crete. Then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. You know, what happened was that the, the centurion gave in to the helmsman or the captain, and to the owner. Instead of listening, Paul said, God's, God has spoken to me, and didn't listen. He says, but now I urge you to keep your courage, but not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. So keep up your courage, he says in verse 25, men. For I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. What did we say that a storm will do? It will help to shape your faith. How many of these he'd been through before? Two others. It's not, as we would say, his first rodeo. I have faith in God. It will be just as he's told me. That's the way... And I believe it'll happen. Now we always have to address this. And is God the is God the source of our storms? And and I realize that you could look at any number of those stories that I mentioned: uh, Noah, Jonah, those two particularly. And you'd say, well, absolutely, God was the source of them. Well, really. What you're really seeing is not God being the source, but you're seeing the consequence of something. See, sometimes we want to blame God for our consequences, for our deeds. See, in the great flood, the flood came because of the wickedness of mankind. It was a consequence and you can always say God allowed. Well, yeah, he allowed. He allowed consequences to their deeds determine their destiny. And then you said, well, Jonah, he certainly sent that storm to turn to, to stop Jonah and get his attention. Yeah. But why does the storm come? Because Jonah decided, I'm going to run from God. I don't like God's plan. 
and as a result. Now, does that cover every issue? No, far from it, far from it. But certainly there are times in life. So I, I do want you to understand that God's not the source of our storms. Our businessman from Chicago, they, God, God would not to destroy his family. It was, it's not the point. God's not the source of our storms. He's our what? He's our help. He's our refuge. He's our sh- I've often tried to explain this to folks, and, 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 and maybe when I was younger, sometimes when I get to these sort of things, I, I might get a little cocky or rude or trying to make a point thinking I was cute. All right? So beyond that, all right, you know that I've, I've often endeavored to help people when they were struggling with a severe illness in their family. And they would say this, well, then God gave me this to teach me this. But at the same time, they're praying for healing. Well, then if he's the source of it, why would you ever want to get out of his will? All right? He'll be with you in it. He'll get you through it. And we all realize that we have lost battles in, in, in the issues of health, haven't we? We have people we've loved and we've prayed for and we've lifted them. And we've, but if they've known the Lord, it is well. It is well with my soul. See, in the end, we always win. But you and I are called to do this. Listen to me very clearly this morning. We are called to fight a good fight called faith. And you don't give in, you you don't capitulate, and you don't surrender to the storm. You don't let your house crash, you don't let your ship hit the rocks. You don't say, this is what God wants for me. Now again, storms come. Does he allow them? Yeah, he does. But I want you to know that he's... He believes in you. He's invested in you. He's your redeemer. He's your savior. See, if there were no storms, Dennis, I wouldn't need a refuge. I would need a refuge. If there were no storms, I would never need a shelter. But he is a shelter. He's with us before. He's with us in it. And he's with us after it. See, the way that you and I respond to life's storms really is a tremendous testimony to those people who live round about us. What a great story that we tell about this man who says, it is well with my soul. What a powerful testimony to those around about him. Some storms are this. They they are the result of disobedience that certainly was true with the flood of Noah. Man, Man became corrupt and wicked in his heart and 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 so this great storm for 40 days and 40 nights, that's a storm, man. Certainly Jonah's storm was, was a direct result of if, if his disobedience. But look what Jonah says. Here's the great thing about Jonah. You know, sometimes we don't say good things about Jonah. Jonah told those men, I know that it's my fault. This great storm has come upon you. He didn't blame God. Did Jonah blame God? No, he didn't, did he? Jonah doesn't blame God. He said, God, this is your fault. God, what are you trying to do to us? You're trying to mess up my my, my life. They said, they asked him the question, where did you come from? Who's your God? Why is this happening to us? And Jonah gets real honest with them. I know that this is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Who was the source of the storm? Jonah was the source of this storm. You say, every storm comes my way, it's my fault. No, no, please don't read that into it. My goodness, then you'll leave here just feeling bad and guilty all the time. But certainly I have gone through difficult times in life because I just disobeyed God. But even Jonah wasn't abandoned, even though he went through a storm. Now, here's the good news. You know, the same storm that that could be caused by our disobedience can also be the storm that restores our path. 
While the storm came because of his disobedience, the storm also turned his life around. And that's what so, my, so many people at times will say, well, God did this to me because. But here was the deal, that it really is true that he did use it. to turn. God's using everything. God uses everything he possibly can to work in our lives. He's not wasting anything. You talk about a guy who's conservative, he's Hebrew. I shouldn't have said that. that was, it's cute, though. He uses everything. I mean, he uses every resource as he possibly can to, to speak to our lives, to help us, to try to change us, turn us around. Doesn't it say he calls us all things to work together for good for those who love the Lord that are called according to his purpose? There are times in life that the, that, that the enemy sends something your way. He is intent upon hurting you, destroying you, stealing something from you. But God is able to make it work for your good. Once again, going to react or respond. The response is so much more beneficial. The same storm that came as a result of his disobedience was the same storm that turned his life around. You know, some are... Some storms, they're just this. They're just an attack to undermine God's plan. A lot of storms in life come your way just to undermine God's plan. We go back and we'll use this one several times, and it's just its such a good story. There's so many lessons to be learned into it. Going back once again, the disciples on the Sea of Galilee. He said to his disciples in verse 35, he said, let us go to the other side. All right. Now you'd think, you hear from God, you do what he says, this, all right? I can't tell you how many times in life, John, somebody has said to me, all right, you know when you heard from God because all the doors open and everything works, except that it has not worked for Bill. Amen. <laughs> there have been a lot of times I got on the right path and all hell broke loose. Amen. Yeah. But here's the good news. Now I'm in pretty good company. He said, let us go to the other side. I, they, I often say this, faith begins where the will of God's known. If you know his will, faith rises up. You can do it now. You, you can believe him. All right. So, you, you know, the first thing you always got to do is find out what's God's will. And if you find out his will, faith will rise in your heart. That's, that's truer than you can imagine my saying it, man. Amen. When you know the will of God, faith will rise up in your heart. And you'll be able to believe God. He said, let us go to the other side. Say, so get in a boat. They start to the other side. And what happens? A furious squall or storm comes up. And the waves broke over the boat. You know, years ago, we felt like it was, it was, it was time to build onto the church. And we'd done, we'd done pretty well, you know, that... Uh, you know, <clears throat> you know, sometimes we don't appreciate what we have here in Texas County. You know that as you know, as a church, we, you know that uh, we just get it pretty good. Life's pretty good. You're good <laughs> folks. You know, I get like Paul, and it sound like bragging. You, you understand? You know, there are almost two million dollars worth of buildings on this property. I, I don't know a millionaire. I don't know a millionaire. All the all the things. I mean, just so many things. I mean, we've we we, we 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 got we got Bible schools in Africa. We built homes in Mexico. Over the years, we've sent untold teenagers on mission trips. Not a family ever went into debt to do it. Every kid that had money and didn't have money made those trips. I could just go on and on. Just you know, just wonderful things. Whether we was at this point in the church, the wall was right here. It's right there. That's where it ended. Right there. In the stage, I would have been preaching in those days right here, and you would have been starting about right there. All right? And uh, in the building, it had gotten pretty full. And, uh, and you know, at that point in life, you know that uh, building pretty full, income was pretty good. Because I, I, I carried this cart around for years, and it had this, this building. This building was 40 by 84. My vision was, you know, to fill that building, you know, to finish the building upstairs and downstairs, you know, to have X number of ministries going. And all that had come to pass. 
And you know what I was ready to say? It is well with my soul. And I'm thinking, you know, this is a good time for a raise. Except that wasn't his plan. And so I felt like the Lord said to build. And we built. And we built the building. We had it all framed up and the trusses came down. Oh, you just can't imagine what they said to me. You just can't imagine. I told you you'd miss God. People in town, not not every person in town, you understand, not every person, but they'd be folks in town, other good Christian people, going to go to heaven, okay, going to go to heaven. All right, they'll be coming up wanting to say they're sorry when we get there, but no, they were, I'm just... <laughs> Bad! All right, all right, got my flesh under, okay, Jeff, the flesh is under now, we've, all right. <laughs> they'd say, I knew God didn't want them to have a gymnasium. That's why it came down. I've, I've gone through that numerous times in life where I know I did what God said to do, and it didn't go well. I've gone to people and said, I'm sorry, forgive me, and had them just talk ugly to me. But I knew that's what he wanted. You know? So here's the thing, once again. It's not always an indication when you've heard from God and things go, go haywire, don't, don't get out of the boat. Don't quit. Don't stop. Amen. Storms are, are this. They, some storms are this. All right? and, and let me tell you, there's a lot of them. A lot of them are the result of living in a fallen and imperfect world. Right. You didn't miss God. Nobody's out to get you, all right? You just live in a fallen and an imperfect world. You know, in a perfect world, nobody would ever be in debt. In a perfect world, nobody would ever get mad. In a perfect world, every harvest would come in. There would be no bruised bananas, in a perfect world. I do not like bruised bananas. <laughs> Every grape would be sweet. Isn't that a bad deal? Do you eat the grapes when you go to Walmart? Tell the truth now. I eat the grapes. I'm not buying sour grapes and taking them home. You know? I don't care if the camera's on me. I'm eating a grape for a bite, Amanda. <laughs> Every grape would be sweet if you lived in a perfect world. But we don't live in a perfect world. And so there are things happen, there are tragedies that happen, there's heartaches that happens. And why? We just live in a fallen and an imperfect world. Once again, I tell you, that is why we have to have a Savior. Sometimes in an imperfect world, things happen suddenly. That is why today is the day of salvation. I'm a guy that believes in his safety. I believe in his provision. I believe in his protection. And I also live in an imperfect world. Some storms are just that. They're a result of living in a fallen and imperfect world. You might say this, and I know that people have. I've asked the question myself. Is there something wrong with me? Storms keep coming. Hard times keep coming. Troubles keep coming. It's wave after wave. What am I wrong? What's wrong with me? What am I doing wrong? Again, am, am, am I missing God? Am I, am I out of his will? I go back to Mark, the fourth chapter. A furious squall came up. The waves broke over the boat. So that it was nearly swamped. Everybody say, Jesus? Jesus. Who was in the boat. Now mind you, what happened? He said, go to the other side. They all get in the boat. They start to the other side. You know, he is the express will of the Father. If he says it, it's the will of God. He is the Word made flesh, come to live and dwell among us. He says, go to the other side. That, that, that's chapter and verse. 
Get in the boat. And who's in the boat? Jesus is in the boat. Does a storm come while he's in the boat? Yes, a storm still comes, and he's in the boat. He's the sinless son of God, and a storm still comes. So don't beat yourself to death because storms keep coming. All right? Do remember he's in the boat. I want to read this to you. Luke, the fourth chapter, verse 13. Remember when Jesus went into the wilderness? He went there, was there for 40 days, 40 nights. It says he began to hunger. There's a point in a fast where your body begins to consume itself. There's a, a, after, after, after about 11 to 14 days, hunger will leave you. Hunger will leave. Sometime after the 30th day, hunger will return, and that's when the body begins to consume itself. This is where he's at in the fast. And says, and he began to hunger, and the, and the enemy come to begin to tempt him, to turn these stones into bread, and he goes through all those temptations. And he over, get thee behind me, Satan, for man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And when the devil had completed every temptation, he departed from him for what? Listen to me. Storms are seasonal. Storms are seasonal. As long as the earth remains, there'll be seed time and harvest, winter and summer, rain and fall. And he departed for a season. Even in Jesus' life, he went through seasons. You can see seasons, is, uh, that, 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 you know, as, as he enters Jerusalem, they're ready, to, they're ready to crown him king. He's at the pinnacle of his ministry. They're throwing down their, their cloaks and palm leaves in front of him. Hosanna to the son of David. His season's about to change. But we go through seasons in life. And I want to tell you, if you're in a season where there's a storm, listen to me. Seasons change. Seasons change. Right. Here's my conclusions for this week. Storms just are a part of life. They are normal, not abnormal. You know, we know that every spring, there's going to be storms. In the Midwest, because we live in a fallen, imperfect world, there's going to be tornadoes. In August and September, the Gulf is going to produce hurricanes because we live in a fallen, imperfect world. There's going to be hurricanes. All right. Storms are what? They're just a part of life. Paul said, let, let, let's don't leave Crete because <laughs> we are in a season of storms. Let's avoid this one. The good news is you can't avoid a few of them. Let's avoid this one. Of course, they didn't. Because it what? It was a, it was a season for, for storms. Storms are what? Storms, are, once again, they're just they're part of life. Listen, faith doesn't exempt you. You say, man, if I just had more faith, I wouldn't be in this place. First of all, don't beat yourself up thinking you don't have enough faith. Now, I'm not, you know, faith grows. The right. Bible talks about exceeding growing faith. The Bible talks about little faith. So certainly faith does grow. All right, I, I believe that. But you can't have enough faith that you won't have any storms. I heard a guy say one time, you know, Paul just didn't fully understand the revelation of grace that God gave him. Right. He was on television, people. On television. Television. You know how much money it takes to be on television? People paid him to say that. They gave him money to be less than smart. Wasn't that polite? That was polite, wasn't it? Faith does not exempt you from storms if you just had enough faith. They didn't exempt Moses. They didn't exempt Noah. They didn't exempt David. They didn't exempt Jesus. And faith doesn't, didn't exempt Paul. But faith will do this. It'll allow you to sail through the storm. And that's what we're talking about. 
the ability to navigate storms, to not allow your faith and your life and your relationship to God, but to become a shipwreck. We have all seen people quit, get off, get sidelined, sidetracked, get off the bus because they were going through difficult times in life. Storms are this. Storms are really a great indicator many times that you're in the will of God. That you're in the will of God. Noah was in a boat and it was God's plan, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely God's plan. You know, Jonah, he ended up in a storm because of his disobedience. The disciples obey God and they end up in a storm too. For them, it was an indication of their obedience. Paul had to go to Rome. There's only one way to get there is by boat. Certainly, I'm, I'm certain that the enemy sure didn't want him to get to Rome. You know, when he went to Rome, he, he preached to the, uh, you know, to the centurion guard or to the, to, the, to the royal guard. And he also won many people in the house of Caesar. I am certain that the enemy, the devil, did not want him to get to Rome. Again, storms in life come, and there's a lot of times that they're an indication that you are in the will of God. Otherwise, it would not be in opposition to your faith. I say again, some storms are the result of disobedience. Some storms are just the ordinary course of nature. It's just, it's, just a, it's just a part of life. But then there are those that are just an outright attack upon God's plan for your life, your will, his desire. Storms certainly do this. They reveal God's faithfulness in our lives. You, you would never know he was faithful if there was never no difficulty, never was never no trial. Again, will I remind you, he's not the, he is not the author of the trial. He's the author and finisher of faith. All right? Let no man say when he's tempted or tested that he's tempted of God, for God neither is tempted with evil and neither does he tempt any man with it. Storms reveal God's faithfulness and also our faith in him. In Psalms 46.1, the psalmist says, God is our refuge and strength. And in the storm, I always love the way the psalmist said this. He's very present. Can he ever be more present than he is at any other time? I, I really don't think so. But for our encouragement, maybe. He's very present, it says. He's a very present help in trouble. So you might be a place in life that it's, it's, it's just not easy. I'm going to tell you. There's the place to look for him. He's what? He's very present. I have often and probably will, get, will again because it depends upon what, what point you're trying to make. But I have, I have often scolded the disciples for worrying about drowning. But at least they knew who to cry out to. He, what? They knew somebody who was a very present help Amen. in a time of trouble. A very present help in a time of trouble. See, when it comes to storms, you and I, we need the courage to not fear the storms. We just say, oh, you know, I mean, for somebody here sitting right now and you think, you know, life's pretty good. And you're telling me there's going to be a storm come. Uh, yeah, it will. It's Next fall or, you know, there'll, there'll be some storms here in the Ozarks. Again, that will happen again in the spring. One of these days, we will get another snow and it'll knock out power. It's just, it's inevitable. It'll happen. So, well, Bill, that's not faith. No, I'm talking about you, ordinary. I told somebody one time, I was just talking about, you know, weighing the cost. And they said, that's not faith. I said, you just pay attention. When I get to faith, I'll let you know. You know, sometimes you've got to be able to talk about things. And then you get into faith about it. Do you understand that? Yeah, denial is not faith. Well, I had to explain that to a lady one time. She was, she had a severe problem with diabetes. She said, "Well, I don't have diabetes." 
I said, you're not being real. She said, well, Pastor, I'm believing God. I said, if you were, if you were believing God, you wouldn't be afraid to go to the doctor and find out what he's going to say. And I'm all for believing God. I'm, I teach the principles of faith. I would speak of those things that be not as though they were. But I am telling you, there are things that are inevitable. And in then, you have to apply your faith and trust him through those times. You believe him. See, Paul had to believe God through that. He says, listen, this is my third storm. All right? Third storm where the ship gets wrecked, goes out from under us, gone. You know, it's not just like laying down a motorcycle on the pavement. It, there's, there's ocean underneath us. The only thing worse than just having ocean underneath you is being up in the air and having nothing but sky beneath you. <laughs> He's, this, this is my third time. I want you to know, I have faith. It will be exactly as he has said. And see, that is our responsibility, is to believe what he said. That's our responsibility, to believe what he said. We need the courage not to fear the storms. We need to develop the strength to endure them, the skill to navigate them, and the faith to overcome them. Storms are real. You have them, I have them. But God's faithfulness is more real. It's more steadfast. It's more certain. Just as I said, the storms of life are inevitable, so is the faithfulness of God. He's not a man that he should lie. Faithful is he who has promised. He who hath begun a good thing in you will perform it. Yeah. Yeah. Again, uh, understanding that we have lots of folks. You know, even for our nation, it's been a difficult time from 208 to now. We've gone through the biggest recession in our lifetime. Forecasts still don't look good. But you know what? I believe still faithful is he that's promised. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Every head bowed, no one looking around. You know, people walk through storms in their families. Golly. I mean, there's all kinds of things that hurt you deep, but there's nothing deeper. And that's deep. It could be contention. It could be divorce. It could be a broken relationship, broken marriage. It could be a health crisis. They're, They're very real. storm that takes place in our family but again I'm going to tell you just like just like Paul I believe it will turn out just like he says we'll look to his word we'll see what did he say you might be here might be a storm in your family you may have a financial storm you may have a health storm it may be a personal crisis in your life You're struggling with heaviness of heart, depression. You may be abandoned. Your storm might be endeavoring to overcome addiction. Will it always be this hard? Can I tell you this? For every storm, There's a calm that comes in the aftermath. Just withstand the storm. There's a calm coming. Withstand the storm. There's a peace that passes understanding. Just withstand the storm. Every storm brings a rain and every rain eventually brings a harvest. Just withstand the storm. Every trial will eventually give God a tribute. Withstand the storm. Heads bowed, no one looking around. First, you might be here this morning, and my my first concern is always the eternal condition of our lives. You know, God's got a plan for this life, and we're talking about this life right now and the storms that we endure in it. 
His ultimate plan, though, is not just to help you to survive the storms of this life. His ultimate plan is to have an eternal relationship with you. God cared about you so much that he sent his son to suffer the heaviness of life so that you could live. Jesus came and he dies so that you can have life and life more abundantly. Again, you might be here this morning and maybe you've never accepted Christ as your personal Savior. We'd like to give you an opportunity to do that. The Bible does say today's the day of salvation. You're not here by an accident. There really is a real heaven and and there really is a real hell. Hell wasn't meant for us. But we may suffer the consequence of it if we don't receive God's solution, His Son, our Savior. You might be here and say, Bill, I've known the Lord, but I've I'm like Jonah. I've kind of I kind of ran. I've run as fast as my feet would take me. I don't even know what I'm doing here this morning. It's because, again, he's got a plan. You may be going through enough heartache in life right now that you may be like Jonah. You, you, you're ready to cry out. You might find yourself, he said, man, here I was, and I'm, I'm in the depths, and I cried out to God, and he heard me. You might be in that deep spot in your life, a deep black hole. But I'm going to tell you, he can hear. He's very present, very present. He's present in the belly of a whale or a big fish. If you're here this morning and say, Pastor, I'm not certain I've ever made a decision about Christ. Let me ask you these things. Can you believe that Jesus Christ is really God's own son? Can you believe that he lived and he died and he died for you? Can you believe that he was buried and raised from the dead? And you know, most of the time people say, yeah, I can believe that. If you can believe that, then you can be saved. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You're a whosoever. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says this. This is not my idea. This is what what God's word says. If you'll confess with your mouth, say with your mouth, Lord Jesus. And if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with a heart you believe, way down deep inside you believe. Then it says, and with the mouth, the confession, the declaration is made. I'm asking you to, to more than just ask Jesus to be your Savior, and he wants to be. But he can't be your Savior unless you're willing to make him the Lord of your life, to say you're, the, you're in charge, you're the CEO. Unless you give him control of your life, he can't be your Savior. Are you willing to surrender everything to him, to God's Son? Just a moment, we're going to pray. We're going to invite everyone in the room to pray with us. If you've wandered from God, would you pray? If you're like Jonah, you've run from God, would you pray? If you've never known him, would you pray? Today's the day of salvation. You're not here by an accident. We're going to pray. Say this with me. Everybody pray and say, Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your son Jesus. I believe he lived. I believe he died. I believe he died for me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Cleanse me. Forgive me. I accept you now as my Lord and as my Savior. I receive forgiveness of sin and the free gift of eternal life. Old things are passed away. Old sin, old hurt, old habits, they're all passed away. Everything has become new. Thank you for a brand new heart. Thank you for a brand new life. You are my Lord Jesus. I'm God's child. Thank you for saving me. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. With every head bowed, no one looking around for just a second, said, Pastor Bill, when you prayed this morning, I prayed also. I either did not know the Lord as my Savior, or I've known Him and I just, I got off, I got off the boat. I went another way. I've not fully trusted Him. If that's you in either one of those areas, would you just look up real quickly? Give us just a moment to see, to know who we pray with and for. Give us just a brief moment. Another moment, please. Hang on. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. All right. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Another moment. All right. Thank you. Lord, I thank you. Thank you. Your, your eyes are, are on us. I want you to know if you prayed this morning, he's, the Bible says that heaven rejoices. Heaven rejoices. It's just one. We have several looking up this morning. He's greatly concerned about your life. He, he, the, the scripture says, you know, if he cares about the sparrow, think about how much more he cares about you. Enormously. Father, I pray for these that have looked up this morning. I pray that the love of God would be shed abroad in their hearts by your Holy Spirit. Thank you for so great a salvation. Thank you for saving us, for forgiving us. You're our Savior. You're our friend. But most importantly, we call you Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, God, for sending him. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.